Stop, we're good. All right, cool. So this is retro video game reverse engineering. I'm gonna show some sort of software stuff in Pokemon and some hardware stuff, kind of with N64 and also cool Atari stuff. <clears throat> My name is Bayflower and this is Stump. Follow us on Twitter. Well, I'm in the way. That's okay. And cool, let's go. All right, cool. So this is my credibility. I spoke at BloomCon for the last three years, and they've had me back a few times. That was cool. My first talk was Lessons Learned from Putting Way University, sort of how I found a shell injection in Penn State's website, and then told them about it in a responsible way. My second talk was in the year 2018, but it was titled Almost Everything You Need to Become a Hacker in 2017, because um, out-of-date stuff and stuff. I don't think that one was recorded. The first one was. And the third talk is this one, but not as good. We get to do it again here, which is awesome. And it'll be recorded. That's wonderful. And we have cooler stuff this time. So I'm going to talk about the Altari. Also, hollow. I'm non-binary. My pronouns are they, them. Thank you. So first, I just want to pass this around. Play with that joystick. Get an opinion about if you think it's good or not. But anyway, this story. This whole thing starts with Craigslist. And I love Craigslist because you can get cheap stuff, like really low prices, because a lot of people don't know what they have or what it's worth. And there's a lot of different stuff. Like, Craigslist is great. Check it out. Buy stuff on it. And um, sort of meet during daylight in like populated parking lots, like at a gas station or something, and you probably won't get stabbed. Like, it works for me. And, <clears throat> All right, so I bought my Atari from some dude on Craigslist, and really I thought the joystick sucks. Like, it feels terrible, like moving it up and down. I don't know if anyone in the audience like agrees with me after they sort of try to jiggle it around a bit. It sucks, and the sort of a hacker mantra is like, I want something better, I will make something better. So can I have everyone say that with me? I want something better, I will make something better. Awesome. At BloomCon, like, one person said that, so this is great. All right, so you also, you're legally required to have a Sun Tzu quote in your slides if you're giving a presentation at a cybersecurity conference, but it's not enforced, so it doesn't matter. But I want to know sort of what's going on with the Atari joysticks, because I want to make something better. So over here is a screenshot from Wikipedia that I sort of cropped because the whole image was too big and it shows the pin out of the Atari. We have our pins and they do stuff and basically what I did is I just kind of connected some wires to the pins and touched them to each other to sort of figure out what was going on which in hindsight was probably a bad idea but I'm not an electrical engineer so I wasn't too afraid of the electricity. I thought yeah it's low voltage I won't die and I didn't die I figured out that basically if I connect any of the pins, like one, two, three, four, or five for the buttons, so these here are the digital buttons on the Atari. If I connect that to ground, the Atari thinks that I'm pressing the button because on the next slide we have a very good diagram that I drew in GIMP like six months ago. And essentially this is the joystick and sort of a bad circuit diagram. I don't know which way is ground, and for our purposes, it really doesn't matter. Basically, imagine that this is a fire button, and when you press it, it just sort of completes the circuit, and the Atari thinks we're pressing fire. And the joystick, it's not actually like an analog joystick like you'd find on a modern like, controller for a new console. It's basically just four buttons, but it's mechanically set up, but you can only press two of them at a time, and you can't press opposite ones, where you sort of like move the whole thing down, and it would complete down, or you move it to the side, and it completes that side, or diagonally, and it will complete both of those. But that sort of design kind of can get pretty crappy pretty quickly. It wears out, and it just doesn't have a really good tactile feel to it. And that's what I wanted to sort of fix and make better. So I have a Raspberry Pi. I thought, yes, this is what I'm going to use. It has its GPIO pins, which are just general purpose input output pins. 
So it's like five volts and it can send digital signals or receive digital fit signals or analog as well, but I'm only caring about the digital pins on the guitar right now, so that's what I was using. It's also just really easy to develop on. You just sort of like download the like uh, image, you put it onto the SD card, you like create one file so that you can actually SSH into it, and it has just Python, so I don't have to install it or do anything. <coughs> I like Python. It's easy to just sort of quickly, rapidly develop and prototype stuff with it, and that's why I used it. Yeah, so I was sort of playing around. I knew about this one Python GPIO library that I'd previously used on a Raspberry Pi to control a remote-controlled car. When we were trying to make an iPhone app that would control a remote-controlled car, I called it Cellular Rover, and it won second place at a hackathon a few years ago. And so I just sort of connected some Raspberry Pi pins to the Atari pins. I turned them on and off. <clears throat> I think I was playing... I, have, I do have this. This game, Star Wars Episode V. It shows this game because I thought the game sucked, but it used up, down, left, right, and fire. So I was okay with like sort of seeing this game a lot and hearing the game a lot when I was in sort of a bad situation. It was like, oh, I hope it works, I hope it works. And I thought, you know what? I already don't like this game. I'm okay with hating this game because if I used a really good game like Missile Command that also fit my requirements, I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll hate Missile Command. And I already really loved it and didn't want to hate it sort of turned the pins on off, wow, and I was like, wow, because at one point the spaceship moved. And I sort of figured out what I did, and slide. I'm like, all right, yes, it's good. So what I had to do next was sort of get USB inputs and then convert that to Atari inputs, but I am a good programmer, or maybe a bad programmer. I'm a programmer, and I thought, that's scary. I want to do something easy instead, and so I just sort of wrote abstract code that I hoped would be useful in the future and save myself time. And I made a sort of joystick class where it just sort of said, all right, these are the pins, these are the numbers that go to the buttons. It had like a press up function, a press a down function. It was really good. And I was like, ah, yes, this will be useful to me, I hope. And it was. I... All right. So I was getting USB inputs. Eventually, I found a Python library called EvDev. But the problem with it is that it doesn't just like listen to everything. So we have to tell it, hey, call this function and listen to these devices. And thankfully, I was able to just sort of to get a list of devices that I was interested in by just doing ls dev input, which is like basically every single thing that my computer was taking input from. And then I just <clears throat> ran that through grep and tried to find anything with event. Now Pat put that to a file called EVs because that was like three letters and easy to type and I was like, yeah, this is fine at the time. I have Python open that up and then it can sort of see what's going on. It says, all right, these are the ones I care about. I took some nice sample example code of how people use the library and I mangled that and it was basically just printing out every button I pressed. And I was like, yes, this is perfect because um, like thinking about, oh no, I need to get USB input. That's really scary, but just having a sort of feed of strings that I can just parse, that's, that's a lot easier. All right, so my new goal was just to associate an input string with a function call. And in Python, everything is an object. So basically what I did is I had a dictionary where the keys were the input strings that I wanted. So I'd say, all right, so I'm gonna bind a key, I'm gonna bind a key, I'm gonna bind a key to like a different input. So the way the code works is actually is, where's a good controller? So I have my controller and I just press sort of the buttons. I want them to be in a certain order and then it'll say, all right, cool. This input string is just gonna be the key in the dictionary and the contents of the dictionary are going to be the function. And I just sort of like, call functions, and it's really cool, and my code's on GitHub, and I think it's mentioned in a later slide, but not this one. Basically, first it goes through binding mode. Every single new input from the controllers is sort of bound to a joystick function. I ignore analog input because that turns out to be a huge pain in the butt to deal with, and I don't want to, like, I tried writing code to sort of simplify it, but it just didn't work, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to ignore analog input. But basically, after 10 unique inputs, because we have player one and player two in the Atari, it's going to have everything bound, and it's going to go into play mode, where we actually get to play the games. And making a good note to myself up here, left, right, down, fire up. 
That's the order I have to press the buttons in to make it work how I want. I don't know why, it just is that way and I don't want to change it because it works. So now I think it's time for a live demo of this. So uh, let's plug in. Are you plugged in? All right, cool. Apparently Atari makes sure you're capturing it. Oh, hey, that was a sound. Is my Atari even plugged in? Oh my god. Make sure the Atari's plugged in before you do your demo. Tangled. Plugged in like two minutes ago. Come on. All right, that's Frogger. Um, so now. All right, so. I need to have my phone turn on a Wi-Fi hotspot for the Raspberry Pi to connect to. Then I'm going to SSH into it and have it do stuff. And hopefully it does what I want. So I have my dance pad that I'm going to use to play Frogger, hopefully. And then this thing is plugged in as well. So, find player two first, and I want to be. Yeah. All right. I'm in. All right, cool, it should be running now. So I'm gonna press down, left, right, fire up on this controller, and then that's how fire, and this is up. And hopefully, let's just, all right, yeah, cool. So if I hit reset, it's a little jingle. And hopefully, as I step on the dance pad, Frogger's gonna move around. Oh, cool, it worked. <laughs> Wait, hello? All right, so it was working before. Excuse me. Oh, apparently it's this one. All right, uh, I'm gonna restart the Raspberry Pi so that I actually get to use the dance pad. Actually, I think I can set it to two-player mode. All right, so I reset. All right, yeah. Oh, wait, did I unplug it? All right, I'm just gonna turn it off and back on. Because, like, but, for my part, it's going to come out of the game. Uh, like, my demo is going to come out of that. Oh, that's so that's high level. coming out of this. Oh. That's cool. Okay. So, were, were we going to have an echo? Uh, or? No, no. They were just too much. Oh. Yeah. All right. All right, let's try finding this one first. Down, left, right, fire, up. Down, left, right, fire, up. Turn on Frogger. Hit reset. Wait, 
this one again? Alright, cool. Yeah, so I'm playing Frogger with this. Die. Alright, so now it should be maybe in two player mode. If I die on this, I can play on this. Alright, so. Die. Yeah, here we go. Just that the dance pad I'm using sort of has been folded up for a long time and it kind of sucks. If anyone wants to come up and try stamping their way across the river, feel free. Anyone? All right. All right, one person wants to try. Come on up. All right, so you can see it up there. I can see back here. So if you step on up, it should move up. All right. Maybe it can't move up. Wait. All right, all right, now it should work, maybe. Yeah. All right. So now, you have to also sort of move side to side because there's cars. Alright, so you get to go and then we're gonna finish this part of the talk and he's gonna talk about Pokemon. Yeah. Frogger's hard. <laughs> so cool. It worked! Yay! Alright, uh, questions, we'll do that at the end. But remember your questions. Contact me, yes. That's my Twitter handle, that's an email, and that's a Google Voice phone number. And if you go back and find that tweet, it'll probably have pretty close to these slides. Nice, yeah. Ooh. Uh, for, uh, I thought it was, I like getting deep into how things work on uh, code level and such, and what unintended behavior things can be made to have. Uh, like, uh, so I, quite a while ago, I, did a uh, <laughs> bootloader in a in a Windows device driver, and less long ago, I uh, made I put together uh, this device here, which uh, here's an Arduino, and it's uh, connected to a cut off N64 controller cable, and it this is set up to bit bang the controller protocol. So that I can make interesting things happen with the uh, uh, out of the uh, expansion slot of it, namely uh, reading and writing save files from cartridges plugged into a transfer pack, which we will be uh, seeing in a bit. But uh, so I'm mainly going to be talking about some things in the first-gen Pokemon games. Uh, like there are a lot of edge cases that aren't properly handled in them. And we can, uh, we can uh, exploit some of them. And uh, uh, my main involvement in this, uh, in, like with making int uh, interesting things happen here is to uh, like, is to speed run the games and help uh, improve the routes of them so that's the main angle that I'm uh, coming at it with but uh, that's just something to finding ways to do it faster as a uh, something to exploit the game for <laughs> So there was a large the way that the, the popularity of the games had, and uh, people were stumbling upon things. And 
hearing stories about them and something that just often resulted in uh, untrue legends, but also uh, but also in things that have something uh, that look like that don't look that useful, but have something a little bit deeper going on. So, uh, like at the on the uh, east on the passage out of Pewter City to the east, if you haven't beaten Brock yet, there's an NPC that will forcibly talk to you and walk you over there. And if you skip them, which you can do by saving and reloading at a particular spot, and you talk to them from the right, uh, the game tries to load the movement data that you're to follow, but uh, according to the coordinate that you talk to them from, but there isn't one set for that. So the game appears to be completely soft-locked and not doing anything. But there's still that loop going on that March, uh, that isn't looking for any uh, form of Terminator in the table because that's not supposed to happen. So it continues marching through the entire address space. And uh, for something uh, for a matching entry in that table. So that also includes RAM, where we have uh, like where we have our own data. So I can bypass this through that save and reload I mentioned. Speed up. So let's invoke that edge case there. Ah, right. You're there. I'll uh, scroll to what we've got there. Nice thing about 16 bit address spaces, you can just scroll right through them. Where's 70? So here's the the table of your coordinates and the address of the movement data for them. So uh, hex 11, hex 23, you use one set. Hex 12, hex 25, you use another. But there was only a uh, there were only a few tiles that where that was supposed to happen. So there's no uh, counting, no check, no bounce checking, no termination of any kind. So we'll just march right past the end of that table. We're in the 73s now, where there's no, uh, where where it doesn't look like a table like that anymore. And if we hadn't set things up, uh, set our party up in a particular way, then if I continued the emulation, you would just hear the music and absolutely nothing would happen, appear to be happening, and you would have to reset the system. But, well, our coordinates are in register BC, hex 1024, and in our party data, which I have down here, no. Oh, there's our coordinates. And so soon it will find them. Okay. Yeah, this, oops. Uh, those additional jumps are for when it did not match. So if we continue there, we see that it got to that and it matched. And then we start copying the uh, movement data to a uh, place where there is not enough room for what it points to. And here's uh, like the buffers around here and the CD axis here. So if I then continue, you'll see a whole bunch of uh, 
random data lands in the memory that's showing. And we, so normally this is in uh, cutscenes, so you can't control the character, but one of the variables that gets corrupted in this gives you control. And also lets, uh, and a different part of what's going on lets you walk without regard to collision. So, yeah, that's like turning what was thought to be a soft lock into something more. But that's an example of uh, like things that the code assumes can't happen that uh, you can uh, get something uh, useful to happen if you do make it happen. And uh, all those links were to the uh, code at, uh, uh, at play in the, uh, from the commented disassembly that uh, Brett has for this. So that's one uh, example. So now uh, uh, we'll go on to uh, We'll go on to this part. So here's the uh, here's the, what I uh, put together for uh, for the well, here's the code that's running on there. I uh, because of the way the line works, I actually did some. <laughs> cycle counted in line of a uh, large blob of in line assembly here to get the right timings, but that's the right thing. Uh, and I've got a Python script to drive it to extend the right things over the serial over USB interface to make it write something to the cartridge. So we'll take a save file. Ah, and it's all cartridge. Yeah, so some uh, Communication will uh, occur here, and uh, it does the right operations in the N64 controller protocol to enable this transfer pack that's plugged into it and uh, write out a new save file to it. So I just put on this cartridge the save file from the uh, well first playthrough of uh, Twitch Plays Pokemon. So, and I uh, have a Game Boy uh, player in this GameCube here, so, so that you can see that this act, that like this, really is what's on there. But uh, so uh, yeah, the. Official software for uh, using that thing is like has some shortcomings. So, uh, like some better software has been made for it uh, called Game Boy Interface, but well, that's not gonna uh, not something that you can uh, like, uh, directly load through official uh, channels. So. In for systems like the GameCube, which is which are like past uh, the older cartridge uh, era, where you would run custom code by being the cartridge, uh, like just uh, like through a flashcard or something, and not uh, but not new enough to like have uh, have. Uh, 
ways to interface with things that general purpose computers can also interface with. And if you don't want to modify the console, you're left with boot with uh, loading it through uh, by exploiting an official game for it. So uh, where that like, the community has developed a whole bunch of uh, different packaged. Uh, save files to put onto your memory cards uh, that you can uh, that use different exploits in different games that you're likely to have at least one of and uh, load uh, and boot some payload that is in uh, packaged in a different file so uh, oh I got this oh, yeah. So we're going to use the game Super Smash Bros. Melee because the name entry for that, the way it loads from the memory card, is it loads the name and then at the end is the little termination thing. So this is the end of the name, load the next one or maybe you're done or something. So that's useful because names are supposed to be up to four characters, but if you have a name that's like a thousand characters long, it'll just keep loading new characters from the name and putting them into memory, even if like that memory should be something else. It'll just write over stuff and we can use that to sort of get arbitrary code execution. And this lets us boot into the Game Boy Player. Yep, so we booted that from uh, the memory card that's plugged in here. And we got it onto there by using, uh, by using uh, some Stuff on a Wii. Uh, Wii homebrew. The Wii is a useful bridge to this because it supports both GameCube memory cards and SD cards. And so, so you can put what you want onto the SD card so through whatever ordinary exploit means. Exploit a Wii and get a special channel that lets you just transfer stuff indiscriminately between your SD cards and GameCube memory cards, and then we play Pokemon. Yeah, and if we load the save file here, you can see that we have the final state from Twitch Plays Pokemon. So... I've got another... Uh, I had a different file to also load onto this, and that's a consequence of, uh, so th for, uh, like for a lot of Game Boy games, the save file is just directly mapped into the address space and is generally directly copied to and from some part of it. And this includes pointers. So, So I have a. Uh, so I also have a copy here of the uh, payload that was used at the end of the uh, of Shannon's glitch exhibition at Awesome Games Done Quick 2016. Is that writing it out? Yes, it is. And yep. So that goes through. Uh, so that has been modified to have some of those uh, like pointers moved into uh, into the save file and uh, well, uh, Lucky Typhlosion who made it uh, has a really nice uh, write up of it that uh, is linked here but uh, Yeah, so there's like, this is sort of also playing into like the like old myths of like different Pokemon glitches. And people used to have a rumor that if you used strength on a truck and pushed it away, there would be a Mew there. And that is not the case. That doesn't actually happen. But this is a fake save file where yeah. we do that. 
Uh, it was actually set up to demonstrate this other glitch for uh, like, because uh, Shen wanted to show that when we uh, when this was done at uh, at AGDQ, but yeah. uh, right, we gotta cross it here. Do strength. So one of the pointers that's customized is one that, uh, well, that's changed is to point to new code is one that is called from the overall code every frame. And so that was uh, used to, like, to make it possible to, for there to actually be the view under the truck. Yeah. Should we catch it? Let's kill it. But yeah, that's that. <laughs> uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that part actually happened because when I was modifying the party to like look like what someone might have had went back then, I didn't do the. I didn't change the experience in addition to the level, so. Just <laughs> that happened, but well, it went over well with uh, yeah. there. <laughs> we just sort of but, had a blast twice that was level 40, it said, but it had enough XP to be like level 100 already. It just got a little bit more and bumped up. Yeah, but, uh, we touched a bit on how, due to the rumors like this, a lot of... Uh, like more complicated setups were disbelieved. Stuff like talk to a guy, walk over here, wait 30 minutes and walk back. And you get the impossible doesn't exist Pokemon. Yeah, this uh, caused the uh, Trainerfly or Mew, uh, so called Mew glitch, to not even be believed by a lot of people for the first few months after. Uh, that was first posted, and like if we took one of our routes and somehow sent it back to 2000s, no one would believe it, I think. <laughs> no. People would see, oh no, you can't have your items like that and stuff, but... Yeah. And there are some other cases in the games where... Uh, where something is not right about what the game does, but a subtle way that causes it to not be noticed. Uh, like, mismatches between the, uh, the subtitle used to check whether you encounter something wild, to, as opposed to, uh, and a different one being used to check whether it's a land or a water one, which is what causes the... Uh, uh, which is what causes the uh, Cinnabar Coast Surfing glitch to happen. Yeah. Where you sort of talk to the old man who gives you a catching tutorial, and it displays a cutscene where it displays old man as your name, so it has to store your name somewhere, and they just sort of said, hey, let's store it in the sort of table of wild Pokemon that you can encounter. Well, so specifically then, the table for land encounters. Yes, land encounters. <laughs> and then off Cinnabar Coast, there's a few tiles where you can encounter wild Pokemon, but they're set as land tiles, I think. Yeah. yeah. So then it just checks the old man table if you haven't walked in any grass recently. And that's why people might have said, oh yeah, I, like, I encountered a Rhyhorn in the ocean. It was weird. Because that's actually possible if you do it. Also, the text that shows up when you use the coin case in gold and silver is not properly terminated in the English translation. And that causes the instruction pointer to go... Uh, into memory that is used for sound effect processing, among other things. It so happens that in most cases it will very soon encounter a return instruction, so uh, nothing appears to happen in most cases, but if you've uh, had certain sequences of sound effects play recently, there can be an increment stack pointer instruction in there, which causes all sorts of fun things to happen. Yeah. I think I remember hearing a rumor about if you like talk to a certain Pokemon and heard its cry and did that, it would crash the game. So, uh, and for the rest of this, we'll switch to 
yellow. Here I've got some uh, So, uh, one of the things that uh, yellow has that red and blue don't is uh, the secret you following you around the overworld. And uh, there are some places where, uh, for, uh, where Pikachu is uh, just made to go somewhere and not move for a little bit. And if you get them off screen, then your uh, steps are buffered to uh, and this isn't cleared out because Pikachu isn't being made to move, and this can go out over the memory after it. So, so if we scroll down to that part of the S space, here we are. And if we step into this building, Pikachu spots that cliff area and goes over to talk to it. And if we move around a bunch, you can see that uh, a bunch of ones and twos representing our, the directions of our steps got written out there. And uh, eventually we'll go over other variables and uh, And uh, crash the either crash the game or make or soft lock it. But we can instead target what we're corrupting with it. Uh, to cause there to be a sign that you can read in that room that doesn't exist. So if we Go back to that. Ah, yes. So here's uh, this is the number of signs on the current map. That is, uh, there are seven different ones in Vermilion City. And if we walk inside, there are no signs inside here. So by carefully counting our steps, one, two, three, four, eight, and eleven, and bring Pikachu on screen again, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. So we wrote a four to the number of signs. Uh, we had to do that twice to, uh, because to get that four we had to step right, which brings Pikachu back on screen. So we had to go from the end and uh, work back to that. But that created an invisible sign at the tile that I am now facing. And because the te because the uh, text pointers never got uh, uh, didn't get cleared because there uh, normally wouldn't be any need to do it, you have uh, this. Uh, you now have the text uh, event index that would be invoked if I talk to this tile. Go past the end of the text table. That's for this and uh, and do text instructions from RAM, which we have uh, which we've set up to contain to contain a command to execute code after it. 
so if we do that, we will get to that, and we'll, I put a breakpoint in there. I had to put this in, uh, this had to be put into uh, the, uh, the sad experience field of our fifth, uh, the fifth Pokemon we have here. Uh, I had to, uh, there was a lot of, uh, this involved finding a route through the part of the game that would give you the exact amount of stat experience you would need to get there to be that command to execute code followed by a jump instruction whose destination is also in RAM, which ended up being uh, the Pokedex flags. So you had to make sure you saw things that would not uh, cause there to be instructions there that would crash the game. You end up going into the item list so you had to, so I had to construct code in that item list that would uh, get the uh, that would give you uh, uh, a stack of 255 of an item, and with a and then return to the game so you could con uh, actually continue playing. I had to you had to do this within the in-game budget <laughs> that you would have by that point. And uh, then you can use that to So if you move that stack of items up, you can then start throwing away uh, items to uh, this bike here is the number is the length of that list but it's not just counted but also has a terminator of an ff byte so only the bottom uh, only the first bit of it is uh, actually getting moved up and if we get that counter down to one that's the highlighted byte in the debugger there And we can then do a little sequence here that tricks the game into decrementing it when it's already zero by merging stacks of uh, the same item. And then you can use that to scroll out into the memory that's past it. And you can swap pairs of uh, weights around. So essentially, in Pokemon Red, the inventory is only supposed to be so long, and we made the game think that it was much longer than that, so we can just sort of go down and do stuff. And it lets us, we're allowed to switch items in our inventory to sort of keep it organized if we want, and this lets us also switch around bytes because essentially there's a byte of what item it is, and then a byte of how many stuff is in the byte. Yeah, you can also decrease every other byte by tossing items as long as the game doesn't consider that to be a key item. Where looks for that is the one. Uh, so so if we toss that, then we've rewritten the warp at the bottom of this to go directly to the. Oh, here. The not here. <laughs> that was, uh, I didn't do that quite right, but that was going to go to the, uh, like directly to the Hall of Fame <laughs> and the game, which was like just getting a setup for doing that as, uh, as fast as possible was the reason why I did this. This route has been uh, significantly improved many times since then, but. Uh, for a while, something derived from it was the, uh, uh, like for a few months of early 2015, uh, something like this was the route for the Pokemon Yellow 80% uh, no speed, uh, no safe corruption category. Uh, so that was uh, a thing. But uh, yeah, that's. That's. Uh, Oh, and uh, 
scouts to the community, the uh, Fred who made the the team that made the common disassemblies, also to uh, Taskbot who uh, that's that like that team uh, accomplishes all sorts of fun things by uh, feeding uh, frame by frame constructed input to different uh, games and systems and. Uh, uh, the head of that team, Dwayne C, did a, a great talk at uh, DEF CON 24 about that, about that, and I recommend watching that. And uh, there are various blocks at different uh, speed events that they've been to, too. But uh, that's what I have. So that's uh, my info. So, uh, questions? Any questions? No? Cool. All right. <laughs> We're done.